Hilary Vizel is here. He is the winner of the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize, the author of more than two dozen books. As a survivor of the Holocaust, he is particularly sensitive in understanding of the plight of Kosovo refugees. He recently returned from a tour of refugee camps in Macedonia and Albania at President Clinton's request. I'm pleased to have him here to talk about his experiences, what he saw, who he talked to, and what impressions he has, and how it uh, might say something to us about how we live our lives and how we focus on the future of this kind of tragedy. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Charlie. Tell me about the request to go. The president sent you with what kind of mandate, if, if at all? Oh, just he did to go and see and, and come back and tell him and the country what I have seen, what I have heard. It began actually on April 12th. I was in the White House giving one of the uh, centennial lectures. Right. And the uh, topic was the perils of indifference. And uh, at the end, since we spoke about Kosovo as well, he said, why don't you go there? Hmm. I felt if I can do something, then I will go. And I did. And uh, this will not be immodest for you to say, so bear with no. me. Do you think that speech on the perils of indifference influenced his thinking as he came to grips with what was happening in Kosovo before the bombing started? I really don't know. I, I, I don't think that's that important. I, I, did, I, I, I represent nothing except words. I, I teach and I write. Uh, I, I maybe words have meaning and words have, have persuasive and force and words can cause right but the president has so many to move has to so action. many advisors yes so many advisors would tell him okay. about practical things but so you never heard anything from him in terms of what the perils of indifference might have meant to him well, he said nice things to me but I understand that but beyond that in terms of decision maybe, making I, ho I hope I hope my words were not lost on him as they were not lost on some other people but just to understand then since that was the reason you left uh, what did you say essentially in that speech at the White House. I spoke about indifference, about the, the danger of indifference in this world. I believe that what is threatening the next century is fanaticism. But indifference to fanaticism is a danger to the whole world. Imagine fanaticism with power, nuclear power, bacteriological power, what it could do. So if we are indifferent because we are afraid of, of, of reality, so we hide it. And it's easier, it's more comfortable to be indifferent, not to, not to feel your pain. Not, not, not to see your anger, not to realize that you as a human being are suffering because you too are a victim of injustice or of destiny. Uh, it can be a patient who, who suffers from AIDS or cancer or, or from Alzheimer. But some persons suffer more than others. And it's easy not to think about them. And I believe it's wrong not to think about them because if I don't feel your pain at one point, I won't feel mine. Morally wrong. It is even, even, I think, medically wrong. Because if I stop feeling, I stop feeling, period. What happens to you, and then what happens to me? And what does it mean not to feel? It means to be dead. It means to die before I die. And that, I think, is a terrible thing for a human being to say or to, to, or, or to accept. I think we are here to do something. I am what I do. I determine myself in my relationship to the other, meaning to you or to someone else. Who is, who is my neighbor, or my friend, or my ally, or my enemy. And uh, that is what I believe indifference uh, can, 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 can stop. And we must stop it before it stops us. Did you go, at the president's request, mm -hmm. to look and see, yeah. with the assumption that we were dangerously close to indifference and peril in the case of Kosovo? Charlie, I, I felt that in our country, and I, I believe that we are a generous country, we are a generous people, really. We are totally a democracy. We are a people, <coughs> we believe in helping always. We have helped twice Europe in world wars. And, and we had no business being there in the, the first world war, surely not. As we have no business being in Kosovo, there's no interest. We are going only for moral reasons. If we go, we must be for moral reasons. Now, what happened was, in the beginning, people were interested. But then they stopped because it's, it, 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 it's, it was too slow. I remember during the war of Vietnam, at one point they began showing live pictures from the front. And always when, at 7 o'clock, at that time the news was at 7 o'clock, while we were having dinner. And I remembered for the first evening we stopped eating. Everybody stopped eating. How can you eat when people die or kill? After two weeks, you went on eating. So here too, I think, the American people became numb a little bit. It went on and on. 
and it's, it was mainly a mechanical war, bombing and bombing and bombing. It had, the war had no face, no human face. We can get excited by a human face. And here, there was no face. And I imagine that was the idea of the president to send me there to see, look, give us your view of the human yeah, face. The writer's of war. gifts and your experience tell us what the human face is of this tragedy. I imagine that's what, what, what he wanted. And look, Charlie, what I saw there, really, I thought I would never see again. I don't compare Kosovo to, to, to Auschwitz. Uh, nobody should ever do that because it's, it's not the same thing. Tragedies should never be compared. There are no analogies in suffering of, of such magnitude, surely not. But look what you see there. I went to six or seven camps. And in, in the tens of thousands of men and women and children, you, you listen to them. And what they have to say breaks your heart. Because there is something about, about the way they tell the stories, especially those who were tortured. And you know, some of us are terribly sensitive to torture. Uh, psychiatrists say that a, a tortured person will all his or her life remain tortured. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It, it, it leaves a scar. And there were people who were tortured. And when they began talking, it, it's a kind of, 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 of process. They began talking. And then they stopped in the middle of a sentence because they were looking for the right words and didn't find them. And they began crying. I have rarely seen so many adults weep, sob like children. The Most children didn't, don't, don't cry. The children were laughing and playing and, 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 and singing. And that, I don't even know what hurt me more, what was more painful to see the laughter of the children or the tears of the parents. And so I came back with stories. I collected stories after stories. I listened and listened and listened. I asked people, sometimes you know, never, never sharp questions, because I cannot do that. And they suffered enough. Why should I make them suffer? But gently, I tried to make them talk. One of them says to me, an old man says, 180 men, prisoners, were shot. Two men survived. I am one of the two. And then he stopped for a minute and he said, my son was among the others. And that's it. I began crying. A young man who was a volunteer working for the IRC in a camp, he too was a prisoner. And he had seen the murder of his brother. And he began talking about it and stopped in the middle, it couldn't continue. And I understand that. When tragedy is too painful, too deep, too all-encompassing, for some reason words are failing us. We don't find the words. So the tears become words. So you listen to the stories, one after the other, and yeah. you see the tears, yeah. and you see a wife that saw her husband ripped away from her and taken off, never to be seen again. A son who and, never and sees the his other father. Way around. This, what the prisoners suffered most from was that the, the, last thing, the last time they saw their families, their children or their parents or their wives or their sisters and brothers were when they were taken to prison. And that, for them, is the worst torture of all. They could withstand physical torture, but not that torture. They don't know. One man said he had in his hand a two-month-old baby, and they, they, meaning the paramilitary, took it away, dropped it to the ground, and he hadn't seen the child or the mother again. And he doesn't know, are they alive? So the stories remain almost in the middle, half completed, but not more than that. Why do you think this happens? We have talked about these matters many times. I don't know why. What is it about a human being who tries to prove his or her humanity by causing pain to another human being? Is there humanity they're trying to show? Or they're, what else do they're, are they showing their fear or there's something else? Maybe they try to show something that in this century uh, it is human to be inhuman. Human to be inhuman. Yeah. In this, but, but in the end it is. If you it look at that kind of natural. cruelty... And obscenity, it is in fact. I believe it is inhuman. It is in fact a, a inhuman, and it's a rage that takes them beyond all rationality. They yes. place themselves outside the human condition. 
That means I would not like to think of them as human beings, except to the fact that some human beings are inhuman, and therefore we must fight them and condemn them. And the responsibility of the United States and NATO with respect to those people is to do what? I went really, in, in my own mind, to tell them, look, I want to hear you. you know, the, worst, the worst fate of the prisoner is to think that he has been abandoned, that nobody cares. His story has not been heard. And therefore I said, well, at least look, and they were so grateful. Not, they didn't know who I was, really. But I came to listen to them. And, 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 and I went back moved by their gratitude because really, after all, I go away. I come and for an hour or two or a day or two and go away. But they remained. But they were so grateful for that hour, for those five minutes I gave, let's say, a, a young girl. I, I asked, I, I said, tell me, she was 19, I think, and she wanted to go to Canada because if, unless she goes back to Kosovo to study. And I said, all right, you are going to Canada. You meet. Later on, you meet a young boy, you fall in love with him and he with you, and then you find out that he's Serb, of Serbian origin. What happens? She, oh, no, she said, never. I said, come on, he didn't do anything to you or to your people. He's young, nevertheless. So you, you hear at least the stories, and then you try to, to argue a little bit against hatred, but without success. But this is really why I went there. I, I always do that, uh, if I can, to tell the victim that the victim is not alone that they're not alone in terms of those there or in terms of those in history or both oh we were alone and i was that's why i never te i didn't tell them that but, you know when, when in you were alone but you didn't tell them they were alone i exactly i but that's for, because i was alone i felt i should not tell them they were alone but we were alone at that time we were waiting for people to come to us but nobody can what did they ask you they asked me, number one, how long are we going to be here? And then the, some of them complained, but small complaints, really, about, uh, about the, whole, the whole world. What do you why mean? can't we get water? But, why can't we get medicine? No, why no, not that they can. Really, they didn't complain much about that. I mean, why, why does it happen to us? What did we do, they said. What did we do to deserve that? What did you it's say? an important question. What did you say? I said, look, I could give you silly answers, but I don't want to give you silly answers. You, you deserve more than that. And the answer is, I don't know. The truth is, I don't know. I know you didn't do anything. I know you are innocent. And I don't know why you suffer. All I know is that I must be here at least. I must be. I cannot suffer in your place. But I have to be present to your suffering. That's all I can do. But those that made them victims can't answer that question either. Oh, they know why. They know because Milosevic wants a greater Serbia. And so that's, that's what they did? They stood in the way of a greater Serbia? Absolutely. That's the answer? That's his answer, at least. Absolutely. He wanted so you say to them, the reason you did nothing, you just stood in the way of a greater Serbia? That means you became an object. I didn't want to tell them that. It you became be a pawn in a political game. A pawn in a political game. Because he wants to, be, and he had to enter history, his history, as the, as the person who, who re-established greater Serbia. So what should, what, suppose we had ultimate power over Milosevic and over everybody who had ever done any of this. What do we do with them? Now? Yes. First, we must bring back the victims. You know, I think more of the victims than of the victimizers. Uh, we must bring back these people. They should not stand, they should not stay there for the win winter. It's a catastrophe. For the winter? It's, it would be a catastrophe. And so, and they should not, they should not abandon Kosovo, their country. They must go back. They want to go back. Most of them? Most of them want to go back. Absolutely. And if, I said to them, if, 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 if protected right. by NATO. By the way, they love NATO, <laughs> and they love America, and they love the president. One of them, uh, I said to the, one of them, tell me, what do you think? When would you go back? He said, well, it all depends on God. Silence. Anton Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Good company, right? Amazing. Uh, they believe that and America they have, they, And they're glad that the Americans and the... Brits and the, everybody bombed I asked them Serbia. that too. But they, and, and, asked. and that maybe those who were bombed didn't deserve it either, to be bombed. I asked them. There were victims the, too. I said, tell me the truth. After all, it, the bombing accelerated the process. I'm sure he wanted to do it anyway, but it accelerated it. Yeah. What do you think about the bombing? He said, absolutely. It's a good thing. We are for it. And one of them, an intellectual, said to me, you know, it's like the French during D-Day. The Allied bombed, bombed French villages. But the people were angry not at 
the Allies, but the Germans. And here too, for we are angry there. for being there. We are angry at at at, at, at Milosevic. Yeah, but do they have? I mean, is there any sense of of the fact that there are Serbs uh, who, in hospitals and people who have been victims of the bombing, you know, because their leader inflicted yes. punishment on the Kosovo Albanians. They Did they have any feeling for them? No. Do they? No. no. They, I don't care. We don't care. They are very angry. Whatever happened to them is okay. Whatever, you know, and, it, and, it, and in the end, whether you're taken out of your house and shot or whether the, a bomb comes and destroys your house in, in a village somewhere, it doesn't make any difference in sure. terms of you die. Yeah. You die. I mean, they are so angry that their anger has turned into hatred. Hate? Yes, they hate. Back to what you think should be. So you'd like, what should happen to the people who do things like this? And should Milosevic be tried as a war criminal? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think even now, even when he makes peace, he will have, he already signed, he will sign, he will come back to the table on his knees. But I think we should uh, not withdraw the indictment. This man is a criminal. He must, he must remain in history as the person who was indicted for crimes against humanity. Should he be put to death if convicted? That's, I, I don't, I'm against that, pun, that uh, capital punishment. You are, in all circumstances? Generally. Very, not all. Very, rarely, not all. very, not all. Exceptions. Exceptions. Any exceptions in Kosovo? I don't know. Eichmann, for instance, who was sentenced to death, I, I didn't protest his death sentence. Execution? No. How did you feel when he was executed? The butcher of Auschwitz? The butcher, no, the butcher. He was the man who was responsible for millions of people yeah. in, who died in Auschwitz. Yeah. I felt somehow that history occasionally has a sense of, of justice. So it was justice? It was justice. But how far is Milosevic, say, from Eichmann, then? Nevertheless, I don't compare. Again. I know you don't, Eichmann, but I know you don't. Eichmann, but I mean wanted, Eichmann wanted the last Jew to die yeah. in, in a gas chamber or, or in, in, in a killing field. Milosevic is bad enough. I he wants I'm not making the comparison. I'm just asking why. how far is one from the other, those people who somehow feel I, like, in the interest of greater Serbia, in the interest of ethnic cleansing, sure. a million without people. comparing the two. As, as a million is. people. He expelled a million. Yeah. He, he deprived a million people well, of, their, of their life. You wouldn't cry memory. if he was... I wouldn't cry, no. no. Wouldn't cry. Or even raise an objection. I, if, if you tell, I don't think that they, they, they have that sentence. I don't think so either. No. Uh, what should we do now, having been there? We should w move as fast as we can to get the uh, UN and United Nations and the Russians and all in place so these people can go back home. That's the mandate? They should go back, first of all, home. And... All that we wanted to do now in the camps to winterize certain tents and barracks, we should do there in Kosovo. There is something about a person who is rebuilding his home on the ruins and another who is doing it in a tent in a refugee camp. So we must break them home, protect them, and at the same time protect the Serbs. It is mm. paradoxical and sure. ironic. In their, protect the yeah. Serbs from the vengeance, from the anger, from the ire. It, it's of, essential of we do that. We must so that do that. Violence does not begin violence. Exactly, exactly. Then I would organize, I would bring, I would appeal to the American Association of Psychiatrists and Psychotherapists to send therapists there to mm -hmm. teach people how to deal with children, for instance, because they will need therapy. The children have seen certain things. They laugh today because they repressed all the other things. I would appeal to them to send delegations and to teach for a month or so uh, how to treat them, how to help them, how to cure them, how to appease them and how to make them cope with life. I think they ought to go over there and rebuild as fast as they possibly can. Okay. Marshall plan. You know, and I think they have a Marshall plan, plan and yeah. I think that they ought to call on, on the private sector and around the world and say, you're gonna do your part here. Now here comes the moral question which you grapple with. When do we, when are we indifferent? When do we accept the peril of indifference, even if our heart says one thing? And how many places can we afford to act because we don't want to accept the peril of indifference. Is it in... My feeling is if we... Why is one different than the other? If we behave morally, properly, with integrity, a sense of integrity, in this case, it will discourage others from doing the same thing. That's easy to say and it doesn't grapple with a hard question. I mean, how, in the past, how is not the peril of indifference at play if anywhere Anywhere yeah, we, we allow this to but stand. We should. Anywhere. We must. Anywhere. We must. I think we should intervene everywhere. You do? Absolutely. 
whenever massive violations of human rights occur, I think we should intervene. I also think if we had intervened immediately, we would have spared many, many hundreds of thousands of people of their pain. The lesson is don't wait, do it immediately. If in 1991 we had intervened in Bosnia, we would have spared many, many things in Bosnia. Same thing now. We could have prevented Rwanda, the massacre of Rwanda. That evening in the White House, there was a Rwanda woman, and all the questions were addressed to me since I was giving the lecture. Mm -hmm. And she asked me, she said, why do people care so much about, about Kosovo, not about Rwanda? Good question. And I turned to the president, Mr. President, you answer this question. Why didn't we? We could have saved 850,000 people. And I must say, he was honest enough to say well, that I went to Rwanda to apologize. He did. He, did. Um, he also said it won't happen again. We are at the end of the century, the century of Auschwitz. Some century. The century of Auschwitz, yeah. where you were. Yeah. Have we gotten any better? I think that some young people, I have tremendous faith in our youth. Do you know how many hundreds of people work now in Kosovo, volunteers, for NGOs, for humanitarian agencies? You have no idea. They are so beautiful. And they work day and night because they have learned something. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I applaud that. What concerns me you, is you that the human being is, as is, such. is the ugliness is, is is those that continue you know, as if history refuses to. Sometimes I'm moved to despair. But then, because of that, I shake myself up and say, I have no right. For no, myself, I would. Because we cannot tolerate despair. Because, because, because there are other. If I think of myself, I may despair. If I think of the other, I don't. What should I give him? Or her? Despair? No. So, so you make this trip at the behest of the president to see and listen, to talk. Uh, and you come back and, and articulate what you feel and think. Do you leave this story now? No. No. First, I have to, I'm preparing a report for the president, which, of course, I'm sure he will publish. You arrive back in town kinds. on Friday, so. <laughs> I won't. No. But, and, uh, no, look, I, the fact is that I'm with you, and uh, you are sensitive to the subject the way I am, and we talk about it. I'm trying, whenever I can, I, I do, at least to create an awareness that there are people, a million people, a million people who are deprived of their homes, of their lives, of their, of their certainty, of their family. They're deprived, they're, they, they live outside time there, and they haven't done anything. They did nothing wrong. That's the, that's the similarity in part of so many of the tragedies of history. Why me? Yeah. Why me? I did nothing wrong. I just nothing wanted to wrong. take care of my family and some political agenda somewhere. Yeah. A force of history swept me into the cauldron. And, and I still don't know why. It's like, you know, Job, the book of Job. I love the book of Job because really it's one of the great philosophical books. But Job at least had his wife with him throughout, throughout his trial. His wife remained with him. Not these people. These prisoners who are now in the, in the, in the camps. They may not know where their wives are. They don't know where the wives are. And there is also this. Before they all withdraw, they may be trying desperately to hide all evidence. I don't think they could. Every single person there is a witness. When you go there and you hear yes, stories. There are other more graphic witnesses in terms of bones. And sure. I know they are trying. It's always good to see you, even though. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, my friend Ellie Wiesel will be back. Stay with us.